you for everybody that had a seat. And uh, we will begin uh, this morning's uh, uh, conference. Um, I'm Marvin Zubeko. I am the chair of the York Capital Care Development Committee. And I will be the master ceremony of this morning's event. Uh, at this time, I would like to invite everybody to stand uh, and sing our national anthem. So uh, this morning I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce a few special guests over here. Um, first off, the chair of the Board of Trustees, uh, Dominic Mazzotta, Cotton, uh, Trustee Carol Cotton, Trustee Ecker, and Trustee Winston. I'd also like to introduce the director of the York Catholic District School Board, Mr. Abe Falcone, <laughs> Associate Director, Ms. Nancy DiNardo, <laughs> and the Superintendent, Ms. Tina Dampunto. Uh, at this time, I would like to call uh, Trustee uh, Dominic Mazzotta to come up and say a few words on behalf of the trustees. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. Maximilian Colby. 
it gives me great pleasure as a board of trustees and as the chair to um, welcome you here and above all to bring greetings from the board. York Catholic is once again honored to host the YCPIC conference this morning with a focus on mental health. You will be listening to Mr. Fiorella, an excellent and renowned speaker who will surely enlighten everyone on the importance of supporting our students and families when dealing and or faced with mental issues. At York Catholic, we sincerely value and appreciate parent input. Parent active involvement in our schools is critical to the success of our students. It is our true belief that parents are the first educators and together with teaching staff, work collaboratively to support and assist all our students in reaching their full potential. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, I thank you for your dedication, commitment, and your presence in our schools and in our communities. We are grateful for all that you do that promote and enhance Catholic education. Finally, I would like to thank everyone who was involved in facilitating this event. I thank you. I know that you spent endless hours um, in the, with this event, and I thank you. And finally, I'd like to call upon Mr. Roberto, um, uh, from uh, the, the chair of the YCPIC to say a few words or to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosota. <clears throat> so, to continue on this morning, what I would also like to do is, is acknowledge members of the YCPIC and ask them to please stand. That's you guys. <laughs> I can go through all the names and everything, but it's going to be, um, my memory's off this one, so I guess it's really important. Cool. But these are your, your Catholic uh, parent members for the YC pick for the 2019 Um They, uh, like I said, they, um, okay, let's go back. The theme of this morning's conference is to recognize and respond of mental health. Uh, we are excited today to have uh, Sam Purello as our keynote speaker. His journey was very inspiring and one we look forward to hearing from uh, very shortly. During our workshop, our workshop sessions, we also have some amazing group of mental health professionals that we've assembled to discuss the various aspects of mental health, which I know you will all enjoy and learn from. Um, what I'm going to also say very briefly is this week uh, I did myself go to a training class um, in mental health um, and it was a very uh, informative uh, and eye-opening experience, uh, especially, especially in the line of work that I'm in, uh, in the health and safety world. Um, and I think it's a very powerful tool to help me help my fellow workers and my fellow colleagues in dealing with certain elements, uh, especially when it comes down to, to the, uh, I think, the mental stress and, and uh, anxiety and a lot of other uh, issues that are out there. Um, so I, it's a very hot topic and a very good topic on top of things. Um, so without further ado, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Sam Fiorella. Sam is a parent who, uh, who started the Lucas Fiorella Friendship Bench, a nonprofit organization dedicated to connecting more students to the availability of mental health resources on Canadian campuses. After losing his son to depression three years ago, through the Yellow Is for Hello campaign, Sam has traveled to secondary schools and post-secondary schools across the country to speak to tens of thousands of students and parents advocating and encouraging more honest conversations about how mental health among peers and between their students and parents. The campaign's iconic yellow friendship benches uh, and associate hashtag for Yellow is for Hello campaign are now installed all over 35 schools across the country with new campaigns launching each month. As a survivor sharing his life experiences, Sam is a highly sought after speaker, which is why we have him today, to advocate among parents and students on the subject of mental health. And the efforts that uh, has, has earned him 
this year's Canadian Mental Health Association's uh, 150 Different Ways, Different Makers Award. Without further ado, please help me welcome Mr. Sam Girella. Is because he 
took the time about a month before he took his life to journal his, his experiences over his high school career. And we learned that he had been suffering with severe anxiety and depression from the age of 14. And yet, outwardly, Lucas was that kid with the big smile, always trying to tell a joke. He was terrible at it. He couldn't tell a joke if his life depended upon it. And he knew it, but he always tried. He was always coming up with crazy jokes. He couldn't tell one that he recited, so he would always try and make one up. And that they, they felt even flatter than the ones he tried to read. But he tried. That was him. He was not the stereotype of what many of us think is somebody with depression. That, you know, that goth kid who's always dressed in black and in the basement playing computer games and antisocial. He always had a large group of friends. He had a girlfriend. He had a job. And outside of normal, what I would consider normal teenage moodiness, he was like everybody else. So you can imagine the shock. Uh, we're still in shock, actually. It's more than four years now. And every morning I wake up, I still walk to his room. I still can't fathom that he's not here. I, I, I think my family's processed it. I don't think I have yet. However, one of the things that we learned in the aftermath of his death is what started me on this journey, and that's part of what I want to talk to you about today. I needed to know. I needed to understand. How is it that as a father, I didn't see this? How is it that he was in the pain that he was in that I only learned afterwards about? How is it that I just didn't see it? I, I, There's no signs. I thought that's impossible. Uh, I, I think maybe at first I didn't even believe his note. I said, that's just got to be some drama that he was coming out with. Uh, until I did a little bit more research. And so I want to tell you a little bit about this journey that I've been on since. I needed to understand. So one of the first things I did is I went to talk to all of his friends. I went to talk to his professors um, and for his high school teachers. I, his counselor in, 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 in high school, and I needed to piece together this story. And what I learned was that everything I thought about Lucas was true, and that he was that go-to kid when everybody else needed a hand, but that there were a lot of signs that nobody picked up on, including the week before we actually lost him. He was living in a house with uh, four other kids, and they said to me, Mr. Fierro, we should have known because Lucas's patterns changed dramatically that week before. He, he used to always, his, his uh, bedroom was just up opposite the kitchen on the main floor. Everybody else was either upstairs or downstairs. And so it goes in the kitchen, we would always yell at him because he had a, uh, apparently terrible taste of music according to his friends. And he was always playing it really, really loud. And so they were always yelling at him to turn the music down because he would never close his bedroom door. It was always open while well, the week. Uh, before we lost them, his bedroom door was constantly closed. It was never open. He was never eating with them like he used to. He was ordering in pizza every day and eating in his room. I found out that he didn't go to school that entire week, which was highly unusual for him because he had never missed a day before. His teachers, his professor knew that there was something wrong, but according to university policies, he's an adult. They couldn't reach out to me. They couldn't call me to say we have a concern. He was a, a leader of two study groups did, and stopped attending those study groups, leading those study groups. And his friends just thought, okay, well, he's on a bender or something. They didn't think that this is highly unusual behavior for somebody. And so these are all the things that today, with what I know and with what I've been educated on, based on what, based on what I've read, my own psychiatrist that I see on a regular basis now, I'm learning that these are some signs when you lose your passion for something that you've always been passionate about, all of a sudden just don't do it. You know, when you were very physically active and all of a sudden stop being physically active. You know, when your, your habits break. These are signs. It doesn't mean that that person is suffering with anxiety or depression, but these are signs that it could lead to something and it should prompt you to ask some questions. Things that we, I, nor any of his friends ever did. And so we started asking questions. One of the things that I learned in, the, in, in speaking to mental health professionals is the number of people that are suffering with depression, right? 50%, as you can see up here, of those suffering with depression don't ever talk about it. So that was the other thing that was shocking to me. 
So, so why is it? Part of what I understood is that not a, a lot of people don't even know what depression is, what it looks like, even those who are suffering. I know, as I've learned through the counseling that I've received, that I, throughout the course of my life, have suffered with various forms of depression and anxiety myself. I just didn't know the words to put to what I was going through. I thought it was all normal. I thought it was just the stress of life. Because this was never something that we talked about in my family. As it turns out, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you another story. My, my parents are, are, are both Italian, uh, very traditional. And when we lost my son, the very first thing I did, uh, very millennial of me, even though I am not a millennial, mm -hmm. is I went to Facebook. And I made the announcement to, to everybody, not to announce that my son had died, but to, to warn all parents. My message, my first message was, dads, go talk to your kids right now and ask this question. Have you ever thought about hurting yourself? Are you depressed? Because I've lost my son this week and I had no clue. My folks, first thing they did is called me when they saw that to yell at me. Says, how dare you talk about this in public? It's, isn't it bad enough that we've lost him? Now you gotta tell everybody that we lost him to suicide. I got calls from Europe saying, and, from, and from the United States, from various family members saying exactly the same thing. Not, condole, not, not to give me their condolences, but to yell at me for talking about this publicly. It never dawned on me that this would be something that I should be ashamed about. But I was made to feel ashamed by my family. The reason that I kept going with this is because I had a number, and when I say a number, I'm talking about dozens of fathers who messaged me or called me within weeks of me posting that message saying, thank you for posting that. I did talk to my student, my child, my friend's kids, my neighbor's kids. And as it turns out, there was a lot of people who were in fact suffering and asking the question, have you ever considered hurting yourself? Have you ever been so depressed that you don't feel like you can function? A lot of people said yes. And this is where I'm getting this statistic from. And the, sh the shocking thing is that so many remain silent. I needed to understand why, because my son fit into that. Why is it that he could never say anything? And so some of the other statistics that I've learned, one in four have, youth have sought or received some form of help. And that's of the people who know that they're suffering and have actually are willing to ask or diagnose themselves or have been diagnosed. Most don't. Right? Suicide, the other thing that just shocked me, suicide is the second leading cause of death amongst Canadians between the ages of 15 and 24. And it gets worse. This year, the World Health Organization reports that it, suicide will be the number one cause of death worldwide. 1.53 million, I think is the statistic, 1.53 million people across the world will die. Not just students, across all cohorts. Okay, this is, this is an epidemic. But how could, why did nobody ever say anything to me? I also found out, uh, after months of my mother and I arguing about why I was talking so publicly about this, she finally came around and told me that there was two people in my family, that other people, that died of suicide. And I go, what? How come you didn't tell me this? He goes, well, this week we don't talk about this. Because even to me, to your family, had I known that there was a history of this in our family, maybe if somebody had, you know, and in fact I know that we have osteoporosis, we have leukemia, we've got all kinds of issues going throughout my family that I've been pre-screened for because I knew I was getting help. So you don't think I would have actually got some help for my son had I known that there's a potential? Maybe I would have put two and two together? I don't know. It's a guilt that I live with every single day. And my mom and I still argue about it, quite frankly. So one of the reasons why I'm here and I do what I do today is because I want you to not be ignorant the way that I was. I want you to understand that this is here. This is something we should be talking about. And by talking about it, we can prevent it. The crazy thing is that suicide is 100% preventable. 100% preventable, unlike cancer, unlike leukemia, when you sometimes you get someone who's diagnosed with stage four cancer, it's too late at that point. It's not too late for suicide because if we can talk about it, if we can understand what the symptoms are, we can now hopefully save some people. Right? But it's about talking about it, it's about understanding what it is. So why is it? 
A lot of people say that's not right because talking about suicide will encourage suicide. Right? I'm sure a lot of you have heard that. Uh, my psychiatrist told me it's called the contagion factor. Right? It sort of spreads. And you, you've heard of suicide packs where sometimes four and five kids together have taken their lives in certain communities. And so, of course, when you saw the, um, uh, the, the 13 episodes, uh, what, what do they call it? The 13, or the, there you go, 13 Reasons Why. I remember when this came out, all of the talk, oh my God, this is the worst thing in the world because everybody's watching this, it's going to glorify suicide, and of course, everybody's going to want to take their own life now. Well, as it turns out, that wasn't the case. There was no increase in suicides after this went out. Because the reality is, that not talking about suicide is what creates a stigma. Not talking about it is what perpetuates the ignorance. We need to be able to talk about these issues so that kids are getting the facts. Because the reality is kids are going to get information wherever they want. I can tell you that I never once talked to my son about suicide. With all of his friends with whom he was very close, he never once had a conversation about mental illness or suicide. Right? They all, they, I asked every one of them. It was never. But we did find out that he was researching suicide for a month before he took his life. Right? He was researching, we saw it on his, uh, on his browser history and also with what he told us in his notes, that he searched how the best way to die, how to, to, to uh, 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 create a proper noose. These are all the things that he was researching. So they will find what they're looking for. Now, the reason why I did not have an issue with this show, I have an issue with 13 Reasons Why on Netflix, only because they didn't, they only provided one story. If you're gonna tell a story, I think that's important, but then make sure that you provide some type of resources at the end of where they can get help. Just like here, we're talking about a very serious subject, but you're gonna have a fantastic panel of experts afterwards that you can ask questions that can help educate you. I think that's very important. What I do with this though, what I recommend to all the parents, is sit down, use this as a tool. Don't allow your kids to watch it on their own. Sit and watch it with them and have the conversation. Hear what they have to say. Too many of us, another thing that I've learned, are willfully ignorant about this because we don't know what to say. We're afraid to ask the question or we're afraid we're not going to know the answers if they do in fact tell us that this is something that they've considered or that they've been suffering in some way with anxiety or depression. So here's some of the lessons that I've learned. Part of this journey has been crossing this country, doing talks like this, part of the not-for-profit group that I created, the Friendship Entry, which I'll talk to you about at the end. I've learned a lot. And as you heard in the introduction, I have talked to tens of thousands of students as I've crossed the country. I, as many, for every one of these talks I do to parents, I do 10 of these to student groups. They seem to, this seems to resonate with them for a couple of reasons, which I'll, I'll get to a little bit more later, but as a highlight, they, it resonates when I talk about this story because I'm not a professional, because I'm not a teacher, I'm not a counselor. I'm a parent who lost a child. And kids, as you know, hate to be lectured to. Right? So when it's coming from one of them or it's coming from somebody that they don't think is an authority figure to them specifically, they seem to be more open to it. And so I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot from professionals and I've learned a lot from the students. One of the studies that I have been uh, really focused on is this one, funny enough, by a group. Uh, it's the Ontario University and College Health Association, or OUCHA, funny enough, is the, or the, the acronym. 57% increase in the number of students who reported experiencing overwhelming anxiety in the previous year. Now, this is a study done of all the college kids in Ontario. That same study, showed 46% of students reported feeling so depressed in the previous year that it was actually difficult to function, right? That was an increase of 40%. Same report, 13% had seriously considered suicide in the previous year. 13%. That's also an increase, 10% from the previous year. How many of you know, knew that? I, uh, my hand will go up first. I had no clue. I had no, I'm sure I heard about suicide. I mean, I knew that it was a thing. I didn't realize the numbers, and especially when it comes to students. So why? I still hadn't figured out the why at this point. And so, you know, I, it, it, my profession is marketing and research, 
is, is a big part of that. So I put on my professional hat, sucked it up, and I said, I gotta figure this out. And so I began to do a lot of research. And I wanna share with you some of that. So I started tracking the number of suicides because I started hearing more and more and more. Every month that went by, I heard about other kids that were uh, losing their lives or taking their lives. And so I said, what is it? Is it just because we're talking about it more? that we're just hearing about it? Is it one of those situations where it's always been around, but like my mom just didn't talk about it? That has to be some of it, right? So I took a look at the reported cases of uh, depression and suicide over the years from, I started in 1980, and I went through to the present day. And I charted them, right? And that was sort of what it looked like in terms of the total number. So I said, okay, so clearly there was something going on over here. What is it that made this dramatic increase? What happened in the world? Right? Because this isn't just in my neighborhood. This is global. Any ideas? Right. Well, 9-11 happened at that time. There's a lot of things, actually. The first thing that I did, again, because of what I do for a living and what I've been hearing, and anecdotally, is that I, I think I heard somebody say social media. Social media is, is like the root cause of all evils, right? This is a sort of our, our generation's rock and roll. You know, what our parents are saying, rock and roll is going to kill society. You guys are all going to go to hell in a handbasket, right? It's all because of that. So today, that's what social media is. So I figured, okay, let's take a look. And I, I charted the, the popularity of social media, which means the number of, of the apps downloaded and the amount of time spent on digital devices, right? And I charted that. So I said, okay, well, there's a trend here, right? Between 2004 and 2011, the four big social media networks were launched. And when you, when you look at this chart, it makes you think, hmm, social media is definitely there. Now, is this causation or is this correlation? At this point, it's just causation. Meaning that they just seem to align, but there, there hasn't been a lot of direct proof that social media causes depression and anxiety. Right? It was just correlation for many years until now. So there's an addiction to social media that not just uh, kids, I'm looking at all of you. Yeah. Right? We, we tell our kids to get off their phones you know, while we're texting them on our phones. All, right. All parents, and I was there, I was one of them, even while I was doing this research, and we're all addicted, whether we like it or not. And one of the things that I learned is that the current studies show that the likelihood of scoring what they call a, uh, above the anxiety severity level is tied to heavy usage with social media. Okay? And this uh, anxiety severity clinical cutoff Right, is very much associated with depression, anxiety, and the types of factors that can lead to suicide. Okay? So we know that the amount of time spent, and, and I can go into all the studies that actually show how, one of them really quickly, just see, so you understand this is not just causation, sorry, correlation, this is in fact causation. Uh, uh, UCLA at Berkeley did a study last year that showed, it took uh, a thousand students that were heavily engaged in Facebook as just one example. Right? And they, they did various studies on them to say, like, you know, how do you what do you think about your life? What do you think about your future? Are you optimistic about your future? Have you ever considered suicide? Are you, do you feel depressed? Have you ever been bullied? So on and so forth. They asked all these questions and they charted them in terms of their anxiety and depression levels and likelihood to hurt themselves. Then they asked one group to take a week off of social media completely, or off of Facebook, excuse me, uh, particularly. And then another group one month. They had to commit to going completely off. And what ended up happening is the group that was off a week, and they did that same study afterwards, they noticed that they had a much more optimistic outlook about their life and their future. And that was 10 times more so for those that were off for a month. Right, so there is direct relationships between the two now. And there's a lot of other studies that I can share afterwards in the Q&A if you'd like. But when you consider that the average screen time is 6.5, hours a day by the average student. And they say that anything over two hours a day is considered an addiction. And most kids spend six and a half hours a day. 
right? So you can think about that. When you go back to what I said earlier about the studies that show the amount of time you spend on social media is directly linked to causes of anxiety, depression that could lead to suicide, it makes you wonder, right? So, why, how, why? So again, I went and I talked to the professors that did a lot of these studies, I talked to a lot of clinicians, and I talked to the students. One of the things that I learned, the reason that, it, there's four main reasons that, I, I, there's a, that we see a correlation as well as causation between social media and depression. So I think it's important for you guys to understand this, because the reality is, you would think, okay, well my message to you is going to be, get rid of social media, throw away your phones, get, just stop. That's never gonna happen. Let's be realistic. I'm willing to bet 90% of you would never get rid of your social media despite some of these, let alone your kids, right, who grew up with this. This is the way they communicate. This is what they know. The reality is we're never gonna get rid of social media, and maybe that's a good thing because there's a lot of good that can come out of social media. But of course, there's a lot of risks that we need to educate ourselves on, and that's part of why I'm doing this. It's a matter of knowing what's going on so that you can address it appropriately. Well, one of the things that we know is that social media is gamified. Social media is gamified because they want to keep you on longer and longer and longer. Right? I design these programs, so I'm partially responsible, quite frankly, because this is how we keep people on these applications, be it on your website, on your phone, or on a computer, longer and longer. And what, we, what, what the, the, the uh, science of gamification is, is people understand that there are certain things that release positive endorphins in the prefrontal cortex of your brain. It's the reward center of your brain. And they've shown that if you get a hug from somebody that, that you like, you have a really good meal, all the things that we're used to doing that make us happy, when you do that, positive endor or, uh, endorphins are released in your brain, right? And it makes you feel good. Well, they've, they've shown that the same chemical is released in your brain, and in some cases even more, when you get a like on social media, when you get friends commenting on social media. Another study that was just released last year, this one's by the University of Chicago. What they did is they showed pictures. They took a, a group of people, not on social media, just in a room, and they showed pictures of, of people they know, just faces. Right? And they charted, that they, they had them all hooked up, and they, they watched what endorphins were being released when they saw people. Then they took the same pictures, and they showed it to them again, but with a comment on the bottom that showed what the person was feeling. I am happy, I am sad, I am angry. And they did the same test to see what endorphins are being released. As it turns out, there's more endorphins that are released in your brain when you see someone's state of emotion as well as their face. Now, it wasn't that long ago that if, for those of you that use Facebook, you notice that they made an upgrade to show that not only can you post something, but you can post how you're feeling. Guess why they do that? Because they know that people are more addicted to knowing that, that those positive endorphins are just firing off in your brain. They're going on and on. So oh, I need more of this, I need more of this. And the more of this you get, the more you need it. And it eventually replaces what you're getting positively from people when you're getting a hug, when you're going out for it to watch a movie, go to a comedy club, go to a concert, getting away from that screen. We know that as developers. And so we, of course, gamify this as much as possible because that's how social media makes money. They keep you on longer, right? And then there's something called negative cascades. Again, another study was done that asked students uh, at a university to go watch a movie and then the next day post something positive, neutral about it. The movie was okay, yeah, I recommend it. You should go check it out. And they watched how much response people got on Twitter. This, this was a study then specifically on Twitter. Then the next day, they asked those same students to post another tweet, but one that's very negative, with hateful words about the movie and about the actors, like as, 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 as dark and, you know, and as twisted as they could possibly get with their words in, in the, the space of life. And they tracked the response that they got. The response that they got to the negative posts was 10 times that that they got for the neutral posts. So this is called negative cascades. It's another phenomenon that is being uh, figured out in gamification of social media, is that people are more addicted to or more appealing, or what is the word in front of them? They prefer negative comments, and they're more likely 
to respond to negative comments. And so for social media platforms, what does that mean? You spend more time. All right, just take a look at any political post today. You know, when you talk a post, of, or a post about religion or abortion or anything like that, people get nuts. And the more negative someone gets on your comment, the more negative you're going to be towards them. And it rolls. Well, these are called negative cascades. It's, there's no middle ground anymore. It's right, left, us, them. Right? So we understand this. So we are being gamed. We just don't realize it necessarily. And I don't really have to tell you about cyberbullying and the link between social media and cyberbullying. Right? So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because this is something everybody already understands. There is, again, this is studies that were done even before the addiction of social media was being studied. And that is it's an anonymity that happens. One of the reasons why we are a little bit even more negative to the earlier point is because we feel that we've got power behind a keyboard. That we're not going to be held accountable the way that we are when we're face to face. And most people are more likely to leave a negative review on a restaurant, for example, on their phone than they are to stand up and talk to the waitress and say, you're the worst waitress in the world. I hated this food. You know what I mean? A lot of times we'll leave a tip out of guilt. We don't really want to leave a tip, but then we'll go outside of our car and leave a really nasty review. Right? This is, again, the power of the internet. This anonymity that we feel is there. The next point on why it is becoming so addictive for us is this sense of unrealistic expectations. Right? There's, there's something called um, passive, uh, uh, passive scrolling. Right? And so even if you're not engaged in social media, I hear a lot of people say, well, I don't really comment or anything. I just kind of waste time and I just scroll, right? Just up a thumb flick on your phone, up, up, up. That's called passive scrolling. Well, even passive scrolling has been proven to be a negative influence on our brains because we start to get unrealistic expectations of what our lives are. The studies are showing that people who just passively scroll and engage in social media feel worse about their lives right, and about their future than they did for those who don't spend time on social media. And that is because, of course, we all post the best of ourselves, right? Facebook is the best of real. And I'm guilty of this. I never, well, actually, lately, I've been a little bit more open and honest about my struggles. But before I lost my son, I could go take a look at my, my profile. It was always about me on a stage someplace, me winning an award, me at some great party, me in, in, you know, on vacation. And like a teenage girl, I would spend you know, 40 minutes taking one shot and, you know, with the sunset just had to be perfect. And then, of course, I've got all of the editing features on my phone that can make it look even better than it actually was. Right? We parents can, uh, cannot stand in judgment of our kids. I'm 52 years old and I'm like a 16 year old girl when it comes to my vanity on social media. That's us, right? It's, it's just human nature. And of course, I'm generalizing here, but, but I know a lot of you out there are like me. Right? How many of you have your kids take pictures? Let me see a picture you post it. <laughs> right? So, retreating from the. This idea that a lot of people call it the fear of missing out. We spend so much time on it that we actually fear we're going to miss someone's story or someone's post or an event in someone's life because we've just become so accustomed to being online all the time. Well, getting away from this face-to-face -face interaction means that our bodies and our brains are getting more accustomed to those positive endorphins we get from those likes and those social media reactions that trigger the reward center of our brain. And it's replacing the need for human interaction with digital interaction. It's just science. It's not that we're bad people or that our kids are bad people. This is just how they're being trained. Right? So, always on. This is the fear of missing out. That's the other thing. That's one of the reasons why they're spending six and a half hours a day on average. This is, again, releasing all of those positive endorphins that we need to be addressing. So, is that the answer? So, I think that was the previous slide. Is, is social media the, 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 the root cause of all problems? All right, I'm focusing on that because I think that is one of the biggest issues facing our kids that we need to address. And I'm going to talk about how we might uh, be willing to address that. But, at the same time, we can't put everything on social media because there is so much more. With my team, we did a lot of other research to say, what is it about this time period in here? What else happened? 
And so we started charting by listening to the kids and saying, what are your biggest fears? We started seeing other things. The rise in uh, university tuitions. Right? You start charting all of these out. Chart the grades required to get into university. I mean, I got, into, I, I, mean, I, went to, I got accepted to University of Toronto Trinity College. It's one of the most difficult colleges to get into. I had a 76 average back in 1984. 76, and I got accepted into Trinity. Now, that, I have to admit, is because of all the extracurricular activities that I did. That certainly helped me. But still, one of my son's closest friends had a 98 average. That's bloody superhuman. 98 average, and Waterloo rejected him. Rejected him with a 98 average. Imagine what that does to a kid. You know, you kill yourself. Oh, that's a bad choice of words. You work your butt off, and you've got all of this stress. You give up so much. You sacrifice so much to get that 98. Right? Your, kid, your parents are pushing you constantly, constantly. You think that you, you're basically perfect. I can do anything I want in the world. And then the university that you want rejects you with a 98. This poor kid had, went to Carleton University, studied there for a year, and then got in in second year because after first year, half the kids that they accept at Waterloo get flunked out. All right, so that's how he got in. Otherwise, he would never have made it with that 98, even though he spent four years of his life with all of that stress and pressure on him. Right? I know a lot of kids that get accepted to MIT uh, with, great, with good grades. Actually, one kid from my own high school, way back in the Stone Ages, he got accepted to MIT and burned out after three months, had a mental health breakdown because all of a sudden he got a 70. His first uh, midterm uh, exam was a 70 and he lost it. He lost it because he just wasn't used to getting a 70 because he was always getting like 95s and higher. He didn't know how to deal with it. What else was there? Cost of living. I got married in, uh, thank God my wife is not here. 1989. I got married in 1989. I bought a small home for $200,000, which was ridiculously high. That was when that, that big boom. $200,000. I had to put a $50,000 deposit on, which luckily I've been working, running my own business for a lot of years, so I was able to do. Our kids today, with $1.5 million, can't buy anything. A condo in downtown Toronto is that. And cost of living is not matching the cost of our homes. Kids know this. And they know, that's why they don't want to own cars. Uber is their thing. Renting is it's the rented economy, you know, is the, the official slogan. That's how they're growing up, because they know they're never going to be able to live up to our success. Right? They can't have what we have. They know that. But yet, we're pushing them the way that our parents pushed us. There's a cognitive dissonance between what we're telling them is going to happen and what they're experiencing. And they can't justify it. So, there's a lot of things, but all of these things are leading to more silence, right? So one of the root problems is not social media, it's not the cost of living, it's silence. It's the fact that we, as parents, are not educating ourselves on what our kids are going through. We judge our kids in different ways. So one of the, I'm working on a book right now called 100 Misfits, and it's basically the retelling of all of the stories that I have heard from the kids. And I want to share this with you because I'm willing to bet that most of you have not heard your kids say this, or maybe have, your kids have said this, but you, you're not listening, or you're not hearing. So here's a couple of them. I feel I'll be judged, the obvious one, right? Do you know what one of the kids' greatest fears is? When I ask, what's your biggest fear? And whenever I do one of these groups, in every group, one of the biggest fears is I've got a fear of being photographed or videotaped. Imagine that. Their biggest fear is being videotaped. Because we've ingrained it into their heads. We've ingrained it into their heads that if they do anything online, it stays online. Even if you delete it, there's always a copy someplace. And if your university sees it, if your, uh, uh, your future employer sees it, you're not going to get the job. You're going to get kicked out of school. And then, you're, of course, you're going to be cyber bullied. You're, you know, something is going to happen even right now. Forget about your future. So kids are walking around every day looking over their shoulders thinking, who's videotaping me in something that might look compromising? That's a big fear that they have. I can't imagine growing up with that. Right? I'm one of those parents, I'll have to admit, that thank God, thank God there was no social media and, and phones when I was in high school. No way I would have ever gotten a job with all the stupid things that I did, like a lot of us did. 
Kids don't have that luxury today. There's a stress every day about who's going to catch them doing something that could be look, could look innocent, but on video or on camera is going to be construed as something worse. I'll be bullied. Obviously, this is a big issue. I don't feel significant. I don't feel important. I feel like I'm everybody else is another very common one. Uh, no one wants to hear my problems. All right, everybody knows, well, everybody's got problems. I'm told everybody's got problems. You're, you know, you're just one of everybody. How many of us have said that right, to our kids? Oh, I went through that. I get it. All right? Do we? And while we may have the same problem, be it bullying, grades, issues with parents, work issues, kids today are living in a different environment than we were. Right? I want to explore that a little bit. I'm the only one, unfortunately. So I, I, out of these hundred stories that I'm telling you, they came from thousands of conversations. And I can tell you that almost every one of them said to me, I, I'm the only one going through this. Ironically, everybody's saying exactly the same thing. But they don't know it. Again, it goes back to the silence because we're not talking about it. We need to figure that out. No one really cares. There's no solution or cure. There's a feeling of hopelessness. Even the kids that recognize that there's something going on in their lives, in their home, they feel like there's no way out. Help is too expensive. Uh, cost and money is a big issue, which is funny because today most kids live better than we did. And yet money and finances seems to be a big recurring theme. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that just everything is becoming more expensive com you know, in comparison to cost of living. Uh, I'm not as pretty as everyone else. This goes back to that passive scrolling. Even the most beautiful kids that I've seen that just they could be supermodels are telling me that they're ugly because they're not as pretty as everybody else. And of course, that goes back to the very real fact that they're comparing themselves to all of these photoshopped images that everybody's putting out. Everybody has this access to filtering their pictures right now. Right? I pick up my girls, my, my girl, uh, I have a 16-year-old girl at home. I pick her and her friends up from a party. The first thing they do, they're sitting in the back seat. I can hear them. They're all comparing photos. Okay, which one can I post? They all have to crowdsource which of the 50 pictures they took and they post. They pick the one that looks the best. And when I said, well, why do you get put that one? Because well, because this one will get the most likes. That's a big thing. My daughter will actually delete a photo if it doesn't get more than 500 likes because it's not good enough. Uh, clearly, I didn't look good enough in that picture. They're associating their self-worth to acceptance of their, of their peers on social media. I'm not as popular as everyone else. We're poorer than everyone else is another common comment, again, going back to the theme of finances. There's basically four themes that have come out of all of this. I'm not as smart as everyone else. So all of this, again, goes back to the silence. So I mentioned that there's four themes. One theme of those four actually has a lot to do with you. And that's what I want to focus on right now for just a little bit. I'm going to show you some of the comments that I'm getting, and I, I suspect you'll be shocked at some of these. Okay? My parents just don't get it. Uh, you won't be shocked at that, because I think we said that to our parents, and every generation says it to their parents. Right? Fine. My parents just don't get it. I am a burden to my parents. Kids feel that they are a burden financially to you, and time-wise to you. Most of the kids that I've talked about where their, their, their parents were the issue, and this is a large number of them, it wasn't that their parents were terrible. They never said, oh, my parents beat me, they ignore me, they don't feed me. It was nothing like that. These are kids from affluent schools, affluent families, who just don't feel that they are living up to their parents' expectations. I feel guilty about their debt. I am shocked at the number of people that say this, the number of kids that say this, right? My son, and I'll tell you a little bit of a personal story here, wrote that in his note. Now, I never once asked him to pay for his university education. I never once asked him to buy a car for himself. I never once asked him to work. He did, I, in fact, didn't have a job throughout high school because I told him, you don't need to. I'm lucky enough. We're not rich, but I'm lucky enough that I can pay for you, and I just need you to get the best grades possible. Because you know you're going to be an engineer, you're going to graduate a year early, you're going to become a doctor, and a scientist, and an astronaut. I just put all of this pressure on him. I'm going to make your life so easy that all you got to do is get good grades, graduate, and make a billion dollars in the first year. Okay? That's essentially what I was saying to him. Not in those exact words, but pretty darn close. 
So he always felt like it was a burden. And what that leads to, and again, this has been reiterated by just so many more kids, is that I will never live up to my parents' expectations, ever. I will never have what my parents have because it's just physically impossible in today's day and age to achieve what they've achieved. And finally, my parents won't love me if I fail. The number one response when in the category of I have issues with my folks. And kids are often crying to me when they're saying this. Too many kids feel that their love, or your love for them, is associated with doing well. Think about it. How often do you tell your kids, get good grades, get good grades, study harder, study harder. I, ex I expect more from you. I know you can do more. I believe in you. You know, this is, you're talking about their career path from the time they're in, you know, elementary school. I know that uh, my daughter, when she graduated grade eight, uh, you know, one of the uh, superintendents stood up at the grad grade eight graduation ceremony, like 12, 13 year olds, and said, this summer you should be starting to look at getting volunteer work or internships for what your career is going to be, because it's going to give you a head start. We had lost my son at this point. I'd already started to do some of this research. I was shocked. But it reminded me that I myself did that to my kids. I'm not blaming him because we all do it. It's becoming more and more competitive, and so we put more and more pressure. So but you think about all the times you've done that. How many times have you said to your kids, hey, you know what? If you fail, I'm going to love you anyway. If you fail, you're always going to have a, a home here. You know what? If it takes you seven years to graduate, that's cool. How many of you? Put up your hands. I'm really curious. Right? Small percentage. That's good. I think I'm glad for that. And I'm glad you're doing that. The majority of us don't. Right? And most kids that I'm hearing from are saying this. Even if you're not saying it to them specifically, you are a burden on me. I can't afford this. They hear. Kids are much more perceptive. So, part of this problem is the... I love talking about this because I just... Again, I see so much of myself, and I see it in so much of the parents that I talk to. Right? How many of you have started a conversation with your kids when I was your age? Right? When I was your age, I used to have to walk uphill to go to school. Forget driving to school. Forget having a car. Right? I'd have to walk uphill. And not only did I have to walk uphill, there was snow on top of that hill that I would have to walk. I was barefoot. Oh, and it was... A hundred kilometers. I know I did that. My kids live a ten minute walk from their high school and their elementary school. I can count on one hand the number of times they actually made that walk. I actually changed my times at work so that I could drive them in the morning because I didn't think they were ever going to get out of bed to get there on time. And I'm, breakfast is at the front door for them. You know, their vitamin and a bottle of water at the front door with their lunch packed. Because if I ask them to do it themselves, right? Because I say, oh, no, 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 you have to learn to do this by yourself. They think, okay. And then they go to school without food. And they're okay with that, somehow. Right? The problem is, is that we have become helicopter parents. I think a lot of you have heard this phrase before, you've read the studies. And this is part of the issue, right? I got to this point, I never really believed the term helicopter parent until I did the research. And, and after talking to parents and understanding and then really analyzing what I did. And I was definitely one of these kids. Right? My son went to university and after his, when he started his second year, I had to go live with him for 10 days because he did not cook. And while he watched us and yeah, I taught him a couple of things, we really just made his life so easy that even when we were teaching, because I'm never going to have to do this. You're going to be here for the rest of my life doing this. So it didn't absorb. So I had to go live with him for a long time so that to, to, to actually teach him how to shop. Because he was 19 years old and couldn't figure it out. Right? One of the biggest stresses in his life when he was 19 and moved into a, a house with some friends is remembering to take the garbage out on Saturday mornings, their pickup day. I'll never forget this. He was so stressed, more stressed about that than he was about forgetting to take out the garbage, than he was about his grades. Simple things, because I raised him to do well at school. 
I raised him to get good marks and do exactly what he did. Get good marks, get early acceptance to a good university, and get into a program that was going to make him a lot of money when he graduated. He did everything I asked him to do. The one thing I never did was teach him to fail. I didn't teach him to fail. He didn't know how. And he couldn't accept it when he did. We've gotten to the point where we're not helicopter parents. There's, a, there's, a, uh, there's another phrase, uh, lawnmower parents. Not only do we hover over them, we just blow everything out of the way so they never actually have to face an obstacle. Right? We bubble wrap our kids, and that's an issue. Right? And as I was talking about earlier, this cognitive dissonance, right? we've raised them in such a way that they say, okay, you go to school, you get good grades, you get a university degree, you get your MBA, you get a doctorate, something, you're going to make a lot of money. Well, I, I can't tell you how many doctors I know, or people with doctorates that are driving Uber right now. Right? And I'm sure a lot of you are in that boat too. What we see, and this is where I want to start, I want to get to the point of talking about how do we deal with this? Because it's not completely hopeless. It's just different than what we grew up doing. So yes, we had to walk uphill in the snow, barefoot, carrying stone. I get it. And it was difficult for us, and, it, and it's difficult for our kids. But arguably, it is more difficult for them because of everything we've just talked about today. Right? How do we deal with this? So, actually, before we go back here, and we talk about some solutions, I really want to re-emphasize this concept of cognitive dissonance. Right? What they have in their brain when they get into university, and, or when they graduate from university, and what the actual reality is. So this concept that while we had it hard, they have it hard. They have it harder because their environment is different. We had it hard, but the cost of living was not outpacing our ability to earn. Today, that's the case. They can't earn enough money in their first 10 years of their post-university career to afford a house like we could. Getting into university, I pay $2,000 a year to get into the University of Toronto. I got in with a 76 average. Right? My son barely made it in with a 90 average. Right? And the cost, he was paying, I was, I was paying for him $26,000 a year, including room and board, for the program that he was in. Huge difference. Right? Social media, this fear of always being photographed, the cyberbullying that's happening on this comparison, constant comparison to people who they believe have better lives than we do. We have not trained them for that. We have not given them the right toolkit to deal with that. And so what are some of the solutions? Let's talk about that. The first thing, talk, listen, believe, accept. Right? This is a mantra that I, I like to share with all parents, because this is very, very important. Right? Talk, listen, believe, and accept. Talk to your kids about mental illness. Talk to your kids to make sure that you, first of all, educate yourselves to know what anxiety is. And that yes, all of us at some point in our, of our lives go through anxiety. There are days that we just can't get out of bed. That doesn't mean we're clinically depressed and it doesn't mean we're going to take our lives. But kids need to understand that mental health is, a, is, a, is like a, a continuum. It's like a pendulum that goes back and forth. You can get from being okay to being grumpy and moody to being depressed to being ill. But you're not stuck in that ill. You can go back. Right? You can hover in the middle, you can go from one extreme to another throughout the course of your life. Understanding that and knowing that this is happening means that I can recognize it and that I can get help and knowing where that help is available. Right? So talking about it is very, very important. Listening to your kids, taking the time away from your phone, from their phone. But if you're going to talk, make sure that you're listening to what they have to say and accept what they have to say. My son uh, saved uh, a young woman from taking her life, which was the start of the Yellow is for Hello campaign. And I'll tell you a little bit about that later, but I want to share this one story because I think it's appropriate to this. What she said to me the day, that, uh, the day of the viewing, uh, within a week of his death, so Mr. Fiorella, it is ironic that Lucas is lying there and I'm standing here talking to you because three years ago I decided to take my life. I was suffering with depression. I didn't tell my family. Nobody knew. But I decided to go to school and do it at school because my mom 
was at home. She had pills with her. She was going to OD at the school. Lucas went up to her, and they hadn't really talked for a year or so. And, but he saw her in the hallway, saw that she maybe wasn't right, and went to her and said, hello, can I tell you how important you are? She broke down and cried because she told me that no one had actually reached out to her. Everybody was ignoring her. Because I was just so taken aback. So he walked me out to the bleachers in the, the football field, and we spent the entire day there. He goes, I can tell you that entire day, we maybe spoke for half of it. And of the half that we spoke, Lucas maybe said three words. He just listened, and he accepted. He just gave me a shoulder, and for half the day, he just sat there with, next to me. She goes, I felt so relieved that I wasn't crazy, in her words, that, oh, this is okay for me to feel like this. This is normal. He believes me. She said that I, I never told my mom because I didn't think that she would believe that this this serious. Because, you know, she's always said to me, suck it up, suck it up, right? So you've got to listen and you have to accept what they're saying as being real, even if you don't get it. Next thing, teach your kids to fail, as I said earlier. This is incredibly important. Kids need to understand that their lives are not a straight line from studying to success, that there's going to be a lot of bumps along the way. Right? I'm 52 years old. I'm in my fifth career right now, in a completely different career. Today, at 52, I can say professionally I'm finally successful, but it took me five different career attempts. I studied political science, did nothing with that. Nothing other than yell at, the, at uh, the news and politics on the television. I've done absolutely nothing with it. So it's taken me five different careers and to the age of 50 before I finally, 45 is when I started this career, that I could say I am now successful uh, uh, professionally. It's okay. It's okay to fail. You have no idea how many times I failed along that journey. Kids don't realize that it's okay to fail anymore, especially kids whose parents are baby boomers. Because we grew up at a time where our parents, most of which were immigrants coming to this country, didn't have a lot of money, worked their tails off to give us what we had, to make sure we went to university, we became professionals, and we did well. Right? That was a straight line for us, for the most part. That isn't the same for the kids today. They have a different journey to walk with different set of external pressures. It's got nothing to do with what's happening inside your family. It's what they face when they get out there that we're not preparing them adequately for. So educate yourself. This is really how we can overcome this. Getting rid of their phones is not, is not an answer. That's not gonna help. And it's not even possible. Because there's, again, a lot of good things that they can get from getting online, as it is for us. The key here is educating yourself and making sure that they themselves are educated at this continuum of mental health, recognizing the issues. And most importantly, and finally, building a resiliency toolkit. I don't want you walking out of here saying, oh my God, this is all doom and root. All our kids are gonna, you know, are gonna perish. What I'm here to hopefully inspire you to think about and do is, that, is to help our kids build a resiliency toolkit so that they're equipped for the challenges today. We knew what we were facing because it wasn't too dissimilar to what our parents faced. What our kids are facing today is so vastly different from what we faced and the challenges we faced. Right? It doesn't mean that they can't handle it. It doesn't mean that they all have to succumb to depression and anxiety. Provided that they're given these resiliency toolkit. Right? They understand that this is coming. One of the reasons why kids seem to really enjoy these talks that I give, I don't give this particular talk to kids, I have one about building resiliency specifically to them. You know, I always start with, okay, everybody get rid of your phones. All right, that's it, no more phones. If you want to be healthy, you want to be well, get rid of your phones. Everybody right now, delete social media, right? And I got kids like, what? <laughs> you know, I mean, a couple of kids get up and walk right out at the back, so, oh, yeah. right? And then I, so I stop and I say, okay, that's not gonna happen. So what can we do? And when I share this education with them, when I talk about how social media is gamifying them, they're like, oh, wow, they recognize it, they see it. I'm not lecturing them, I'm giving them the education with which to make their own decisions and how to self-regulate themselves. They appreciate that. A lot of the feedback I'm getting from the schools is that, Sam, after your talk, some kids came up and says, how do we create a campaign to do this? How do we hold ourselves accountable? 
And this is what this is this peer-to-peer -peer connection is really coming into play. Kids today do not want to be lectured to. Big shock. Right? They want to crowdsource everything. Right? And so that's the that's sort of the inspiration for this campaign. So I told you this story about how my son was able to save somebody just by saying hello, by reaching out to somebody. Well, as it turns out, there was a good dozen people that were in that position that he was able to affect before uh, he eventually succumbed to depression himself. And what everything, what every story that we heard after his death basically boiled down to, I would say the majority of the kids who came to us and told us these stories about Lucas keeping them in school or preventing them from cutting themselves or preventing them from taking their lives, every one of them said to me, he came up and just said hello. And that started a conversation that eventually got me the help that I needed. But that they had all been suffering in one way or another, but just didn't know how to deal with it. So I said, so what was it about Lucas? This journey for me has not just been discovering why he was ill, and what potentially led to that illness. But it was also about discovering who he was. And why was it that he had such a profound impact on people? Something that I had no clue was even happening. And so we created this campaign because one of my friends, we were sitting down with a beer after his funeral, and he said, it's a shame that Lucas isn't here to keep saying hello. You know, we just heard all these great stories at his funeral about kids saying he came up and said hello. It's a shame. He's not here to keep doing that. And so we started the Lucas Fiorella Friendship Bench program. And it's a peer-to-peer -peer campaign. And basically what it is, our bench is the symbol. It's a symbol of two kids sitting down talking to each other and just being okay talking about whatever. Because what we've learned, as I said, is that kids are more comfortable talking to each other than they are hearing from an, a parent or a teacher or a counselor. So we need to make it okay for our kids to talk to each other. They've grown up in a world where everything is crowdsourced. It's only okay if everybody else says it's okay. And so what we've discovered with our campaign and the schools that we're in, and at the, you, know, you heard that you know, get some 35, we're actually over 50 right now, from coast to coast with another 50 scheduled for this coming 19, 20 year. And it's growing the way that it's growing because kids are asking for it. It's not the teachers that are asking for it. It's the kids who are reaching out to us and bring one to my school, bring one to my school. And what they're telling us, once we're there, is that there's an increase in the number of kids asking for help. And when I challenge them, why do you think that is? Why is this working where other campaigns haven't worked? And what they say to us is that kids need to, to be okay with each other first. So what we've discovered is that when kids make it okay to talk about mental health and to talk about not being okay, they're more likely to actually ask for help from a professional. And so that's really what this campaign is about. And throughout this course, we've, uh, throughout the course of this campaign over the last four years, one of the things we've learned is the more education you can give your kids, the better off they are. They want to take ownership and responsibility for their mental health but only when they're educated and they're given the foundation from which to do that. And telling them that I suffered like you did, you know, I had a worse life than you did, is not the answer. Telling them it's gonna be okay, this is normal, is, is not right. Accepting them and giving them the toolkits, which is this education. How do I deal with this heightened anxiety? How do I deal with the rising cost of tuition? How do I deal with social media? Because clearly I'm not gonna get off it. Right? There are tools, there are courses that we can take and that they can take that will give them the power to deal with all of this and come out the other side really well. That's what we need to be focused on. And if we do that, our kids are going to do so much better than the kids of the last 10 years have, and certainly better than my son did. And so I want to tell you a little bit about this program. We really took the... the this to heart, right? That kids don't want to be lectured to. I've said this a couple of times throughout the course of this presentation. We know that. They want to crowdsource everything. And so the purpose of the campaign we've created, I want to just take a minute uh, before we break here to, to tell you about that. It's basically the opportunity for one kid to talk to another kid and make it okay to be not okay. That's our message. This bench is not a place to go when you have a problem. I think a lot of you have heard about the buddy bench. 
uh, you know, it's an, a lot of elementary schools are deploying this, where if you just come to a school and you don't have friends, or if you're being bullied, you go sit there, and the kids are trained to go and talk to that kid and make a friend, which is a wonderful initiative. The reality is that does not work in high school, nor university. Somebody goes, if we, if we promote that, other mean kids will throw things at them, right? That's just not how it works at that age. The program here is completely different because we know that they want to take ownership of their mental health. This is really just a symbol. It's a tool that the students and the counselors in the school use to create peer-to-peer -peer campaigns. And so the visual representation, it's a constant reminder basically, this visual re reminder to say hello. Say hello to a friend, make sure that it's okay for them to talk to you about how they're feeling, and you be accepting of a hello back the other way. Right? So now what's happening, and it's hard to tell, I don't know, the lighting I think in here, I can't see it very well, I don't know if you guys can see it at the back. But what's happening now is, we unveil these benches, we launch this Yellow is for Hello campaign, and now the benches are being used for different mental health awareness campaigns, it's being used um, as, a, um, as a center for mental health fairs. Um, kids are now using it for um, things like you know, puppy therapy, so they bring the puppies in before an exam, which is becoming a big thing to calm all the kids down, get their anxiety levels down. They use the bench as a place to do that. I'm now seeing concerts happening on the bench, spoken word poems happening on the bench. Right? One school, my son's high school, in fact, has one. They were the second school to get one. They actually want to have four or five now spread out throughout the school because the one has been so effective at connecting kids. Right? The University of Alberta, what they've done is they've taken one bench and they've actually made conversation areas. They put like a little grass, uh, astroturf carpet, a coffee table, and a couple of uh, couches along with the bench. And every day somebody brings a pot of tea and puts a pot of tea down at, at 11 o'clock every day and kids just gather around to talk. And they're really embracing it. What in my day and age would never have worked. When I was in high school, that would have been such a stigma to go sit there. Today, kids are really owning it. And it's a perfect example of when our kids are given the tools and the power and the education to care for themselves, they will embrace it, they will make it easier for themselves to get that help. Right? One of the things we also do on the back of the bench is a, a plaque that says yellow is for hello. <coughs> org. If you're on your phone and you go to yellowisforhello.org, which a lot of students do, the first thing that happens is go, it goes to a map um, and it'll pull up the school that they're at. And it'll show all the mental health resources that are available on campus and in community. So that if they're afraid to ask, the bench itself will connect them to who they need to talk to. This is one of the most popular used sections of our site. So again, it's a soft connection. So there's multiple ways that this bench is being used. Right? Um, it's all about peer-to-peer. -peer. That's what it comes down. We promote, sit down, relax, eat your lunch, study, listen to music, talk to friends. But while you're there, make it okay for somebody to say hello. And if you don't use the bench, when you're walking by, because it's always in a prominent area of the school, see the yellow, remember, yellow is for hello, yellow is for hello. Make it okay. These tools have really proven to be effective. Now, this is not the only solution. There's a lot of solutions that promote education, that promotes uh, positive uh, well-being, this is just one that I'm sharing uh, as an example that we can give our kids and that we can put into our schools that give them a fighting chance to be much better than the previous generation was. So remember, your kids want the education. Don't hide it from them. Listen, believe, sometimes just sitting with them without saying a word is all that it takes. They just want to know that they're going to be loved no matter what, and they want the education. Give them that education. Help them that way. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.
I will just leave for the panel, and then we'll just continue and put more time on the panel. Okay, cool. Thank you. It's all yours. Okay, so. Sam, again, thank you very much for, for sharing uh, the story this morning. Um, basically, I want to thank you again for, for advocating um, for better mental health and services to children and youth uh, making a difference across Canada. Um, as a parent, uh, I, can, I can say firsthand, uh, I've, been, I've been looking at it for several years now uh, in terms of mental health and how things have been going. Um, it wasn't until about a month and a bit ago when I did uh, view your panel, uh, sorry, view your presentation at Colonel Carter, where I finally got kicked in the pants to, to go out and actually do my own, my own studies. Um, and it's been really, really good. So as far as I'm concerned, it, it was really great, uh, a really great motivator. Um, as a parent, uh, as a working safety professional, uh, it was fantastic. So what I really want to say is, you know, I found this strategy very helpful, uh, very supportive, and very hopeful. Um, and I wish you well with your campaign uh, and continue moving forward. Um, and I know it's, it's definitely helping me in my journey with, with my stuff that's going on. Um, so that, that's been really great to, to, to continue forward with. So what I'm going to do uh, now um, is we are going to take a 15 minute break, more or less. Um, so there's refreshments, or snacks, or all kinds of cool stuff in the back uh, for everybody to go out and, and, and you know, uh, enjoy yourselves for a few minutes. As soon as we get back, I'll call everybody back in. We are going to have our panel discussion and then go from there from that point on. So if everybody can like, please help yourself in the back and we'll get we in about 15 odd minutes. We're going to moderate the panel's discussion. Uh, so we'll be starting in a second. So uh, at this time, I'm going to introduce uh, our Vice Chair, Tony Marini, with Natalie Robert, who will be handling the panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mauricio. Um, I hope everybody's all refreshed. Um, I, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you, and I'd like to also uh, take a moment to introduce our uh, panels up, up here, our panelists up here. and. Um, I'd like to thank them for giving us their time and opportunity to have a moment to uh, learn something from them. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce. So I'll start off with uh, Sam Fiorella. So definitely we all know about him. And uh, I don't know in which order your city, so. We're a supportive parent, but it worked for us. Um, but the need to understand that failure is an option Perhaps not the preferred option, but we love you anyway. We accept you anyway. Um, we'll learn from it and we will move on from it. Um, so my son failed three of his five courses that year. Uh, he came home and he worked for a year and then he went back to school. And um, I'm very pleased to say we're very fortunate and he's been successful since, but he had to learn um, that it was not a linear journey, um, that the, the path was not a straight one, and uh, that failure is a possibility, and we can accept that. Well, I agree with everything that has already been said. I'll just touch on a couple of points. Apropos to the parenting, I oftentimes have great um, empathy for parents being a parent myself, but even before I was a parent, because you never quite know what that fine line is between encouraging your child, or being overly demanding, to um, accepting the fact that they can fail, but then are you sort of being too lax? So I certainly appreciate the, the tightrope that as parents we all are faced to. And it's unfortunately oftentimes only in retrospect that we may come to have a better judgment as to whether we've been too far one way or another. But to get back to also about resiliency, you know, um, we, one of the, um, the mental health strategies that we emphasize within our board, and I'll speak more about that later, but it's this, the bottom layer, 
where it's good for all kids. It, it, it's, it's promoting well-being. It's not addressing mental health issues. And uh, a lot of the simple things that have already been mentioned are certainly very much there. But even when you think about it, you're, you are part of um, the resiliency that you um, instill in your kids. Somehow, when we see some difficulties, I think we may pull back. But none of us would um, prevent our children from taking their first steps as toddlers because we're afraid that they're going to fall, right? We know they're going to fall, but it would never occur to any of us that we're, we're just going to keep carrying. He's light enough. I'm going to keep on carrying him, right? But what we do do is we scaffold the environment. So we take away sharp objects so that they don't bang their head when they're falling, right? We'll opt for carpeted areas, perhaps. So we try to scaffold the environment in a way to prevent any major in this, uh, injury, but certainly not uh, try to prevent it from ever happening. And I think if we continue in that path, and one many of our approaches within the school board is, how can we scaffold the environment for our students to find that fine balance? Continuing to build their resiliency, but also um, um, encouraging them to try their best. Thank you. Uh, I want to reiterate the, the point of education. As you heard me say earlier, I think that's critical. Um, some practical tips that we found to, to building resiliency toolkits in some of the, the schools and trials that I've done is um, ensure that your kids understand the effects of social media and encourage them to utilize uh, apps on their phone that track the amount of time they spend on social media. Sometimes, you know, just like you track your fitness, you know, your what, the calories that you're burning and your food and stuff like that, having that third party view uh, it's good for you as well as good for the kids. And when they see that, again, they can help self-regulate because they're smart enough to figure it out if you put it in front of them. Another tip that I've seen work really well is encouraging your kids to schedule off time. Uh, when I say off time, meaning going out to you know the movies, having like a Thursday night uh, social with their friends where they all go out to something physical as opposed to sitting around the on the couch, you know, all on their phones. Uh, making sure they schedule that into their time. Uh, certainly helps that way they got that face-to-face -face time. The other thing for those of you that have kids going into university, the, the final tip I'll give is don't hesitate when you're taking them through orientation to walk them to the counseling office and ask them to make a regular appointment. Uh, make sure they know where it is, make sure they know what it's there, and make sure that they understand they've got somebody to talk to there. Um, I know my daughter's getting ready to go to university soon, and one of the things that I will be doing with her is asking her, this is where you know you go for medical attention if, you're, if, you, know, if you have a problem with your tooth, if you break a bone, if you fall, whatever. But here's a counseling office. Let's introduce ourselves to them, and let's uh, have a regular, like once a week, or once every other week, or once a month meeting that you can go in and just check in. It's preventative. But just having that outlet all the time, I think, would be as a resilient kid. Um, we had a parent um, say at our last board gathering for mental health that we had at the board office, um, every time I try to talk to my child, um, it leads to a fight. She ends up getting upset, storms off to her bedroom, I don't know if some of you might recall this, uh, call this parent or comment. And um, so that leads us to our next question, which is the do's and don'ts uh, for parents. So what should we say and what shouldn't we say to our children and youth uh, about their personal mental health? as we try to facilitate open and ongoing conversation. Um, well, I'm going to defer to the ladies here on that. But the only thing I'd like to reiterate on that is that when you do have the conversations with them, uh, just to, uh, make sure they know that you're accepting and believing everything they have to say. Um, they don't want to be told that they're right or that they're wrong. They just want to know that you believe them and that you understand. So sometimes just sitting and listening without commentary um, is important. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to echo that. Um, we have a tendency to want to jump in and solve things. Um, we do it as professionals and we do it as parents. And oftentimes being able to say, gee whiz, honey, that really sucks, doesn't it? Wow. Um, is perhaps um, good enough as a first step. You don't have to. You don't have to jump in and say, oh my God, I can't believe it. I'll call you to 
teacher tomorrow morning and I'll explain that it's fine, that you didn't finish your report, that, that's okay, I'll do it for you, okay? Don't worry about it. You know, we can certainly help them self-advocate in an appropriate way. But I'd like to say that this whole process starts much, much younger than when our kids are in high, in, in high school or, or even elementary school. One of the things that we try to emphasize with very young children is self-regulation. And that really is a building block to help them understand their emotions, manage their emotions. There's nothing wrong with someone being angry, and we can say that to them. It's no, there's no such thing as good emotions and bad emotions, but how we handle them and how we respond to them is the most critical part of it. And there are adaptive ways of doing it and not such as, as adaptive, and that's what we need to start teaching them right from the very beginning. Thank you. And so I would certainly echo that. Um, and I would say that uh, um, not to be judgmental and to, um, to practice and use active listening skills. And sometimes you don't need to say anything. Sometimes you just need to listen. And that if your children don't want to talk with you, perhaps there is someone else, um, a friend, a neighbor, um, another family member that they feel more comfortable opening up to, um, as long as they have somewhere somebody that they can go to when they need to talk and make sure that they understand that uh, it is it is okay and it's important to talk about how they're feeling. Uh, so again, to echo what's already been said, you know, validation and empathy really go a long way. Um, but I think in terms of the self-regulation, I think um, as parents and caregivers to practice that within ourselves. It can be really scary and really hard to hear that your child is struggling. So how do you take that information and process it for yourself while at the same time kind of being, um, you know, we're almost, we're, we're that lighthouse for our kids, right? When the, when the waters get rocky, they're looking to us for support. It's okay to say, Gee, I don't, I don't know that I have that answer right now. Let's work together to figure it out. Or um, that must be really hard what you're saying to me. Um, you know, I, I feel bad and we're gonna work on this together. So it's, it's even being in check with your own emotions and your own reactions. Because um, youth are smart, they pick up on things. They, you know, even if you try to be stoic and you know, that guilt piece that comes in, right? I don't wanna worry my parent. Um, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to tell them how you're feeling and to let them know we're a team, we're gonna work on this together. Thank you. Uh, just to kind of reiterate that, reiterate that last point, I think sometimes, um, you know, when our youth or our children come to us, we feel like we have to have an answer. And there are things that we just don't know. Um, and so sometimes that, that negative reaction is, is not because we don't want to support our youth or our children, but it's because we're trying to give them an answer to solve an issue so that, you know, they, they dealt with it, they moved on. Um, there is nothing wrong with saying, you know what, again, validating how they're feeling and saying, you know what, I might not be in a space to help you, but I certainly want to work with you to get you help. Um, that active listening piece, we're not always required to give them an answer, but just to create the space for them to know that we are hearing them. So, actually not hearing, that we're listening. It is one thing to hear, it is quite another to listen to what they're saying, and sometimes what they're not saying. Um, so I would say, again, to, I mean, sometimes an argument's gonna happen regardless, right? Sometimes we're just, you know, you bite the hand that feeds you, it, that is what it is, but a lot of times we have to, really create the space and not make it about us that we're feeling hurt or offended by what they brought to us, but validating what they're feeling and when we don't have the answer, that we are willing to really support them in finding that answer. And just to add, um, one thing I advise parents, if you don't know what to do, a great thing to do is go and talk to somebody else like a professional, a counselor. Um, most of you are working professionals here. Um, use your EAP Employee Assistance Program. Um, the other thing as well I tell parents and kids is think of the word fail um, and how it's spelled. So first attempt in learning, right? So it's our first attempt. Or think of the word no. We've all been told no, I'm sure. Um, so next opportunity. Uh, 
Um, so we've heard from, well as an educator, I've heard from my administration team that um, there's been, you know, a student might be in crisis over the weekend. Let's say something happens on a Friday night and they really just don't know where to go or, or what to do. And so they'll often wait till the Monday, you know, Monday morning, walking into the school office saying, like, my, my child's in crisis, they're struggling, what do I do? Um, so I think we just want to, you know, provide those tools as to where do they go when their child is in crisis or struggling um, uh, outside of the school? Like, what other options do they have? Okay. That's a fantastic question. Um, one place I would advise people to call, it's a York Region local number, it's called 310-COPE, so it's 310-2673. That is a fantastic number. You do not have to be suicidal to call that phone number. Um, you can call and talk to a counselor, they will give you resources, um, they'll, they'll talk to your child. If your child is under that they can help you, the, the child, pardon me, they'll refer you to another hotline, uh, it's a CANARC, um, I don't know the number of that one, but that is a great number, it's 310-2673. Um, I can't um, uh, stress how important that is to have that number, and they're fantastic people on the other end of the line. I was actually going to say the same thing. Um, at our table, we actually have uh, a mental health, quite a few mental health resources. Again, that parents, please feel free to take that. Again, have 310 COPE, Kids Helpline, a, a multitude of, of different resources that are available. Um, where again, if you just have a question around how to support or, or what are resources that are available. So um, it's at the front. Again, I, I, I know some of you have already taken some, but that Mental Health Compass really has a lot of resources, not just for children, but for seniors, for adolescents, for youth, so adolescents or youth. Um, just, yeah, so 310 Cope, I would say, is probably the best one, but there's also a lot of other uh, resources that are available to you. Um. If you're at a loss, there's always 911. There's mobile crisis teams that come, uh, mobile crisis nurses that come with police officers as well. Um, so that's another option. Um, there are several 24-7 um, crisis lines that you can call. There's Distress Centers of Ontario. I don't have the number at the top of my head, but you can definitely uh, Google that. Um, for, for youth, uh, kids help them because they, they want to make sure that they're accessible to this day and age in our youth. Um, they have mobile chat that you can do as well. So 310 COPE was my first <laughs> line too, um, which is a, certainly a testament to the great work that they do because I think most of us, if not all of us, would direct you there. Um, I do have some resources as well. Um, at the moment, they're in the classroom that I'll be presenting, but I'll put them on the table with our other resources, a page full of uh, websites and phone numbers, probably many of the same ones that you have as well. Um, Kids Help Phone, uh, Toronto Distress Center again, and there is an LGBTQ2 um, COPE support line as well. I'll move a little bit further away from the immediate um, um, emergency kinds of calls and just speak about where you could get some credible um, websites because there's such a plethora of information out there. Just reading through whatever is out there on the internet can be very daunting for most of us. So what is legitimate and what isn't, and sometimes I'll look up something that I think I know quite a bit about just to see what's out there, and there is a lot of misinformation. So I think it's important that you have um, some uh, credible sites. So on our, on our um, board's website, under mental health, and I'll be demonstrating it in my presentation, under mental health, there's a subsection, ABCs of mental health. Um, if you click there, there's uh, teacher resources and parent resources. And you click on parent resources, they will um, take you to uh, any number of um, inf um, websites, but even just giving you the heads up about whether how, how much you should be concerned giving information to your child and so forth. So, um, in essence, even if you have two or three websites that you can feel that you can get credible information, that would be plenty to get you going to begin with. 
So don't feel overwhelmed by the, the multitude of sites. Yeah, the only other one that I would add there is uh, CMHA, the Canadian Mental Health Association, uh, has an incredible amount of resources uh, nationally, locally, for parents, for students. Uh, that's where I get a lot of my information. I do a lot of work in partnership with them. And the, the slightly off topic, I'd also recommend parents take a look at the Safe Talk training. Uh, if you haven't done it, I know a lot of the, the, the most professionals here have done it, as well as a lot of the faculty. I think it should be mandatory for all parents to have that because it'll allow you to ask the questions in the right way to identify if your child is at risk or not. There's, there's another website, it's called Children's Mental Health Ontario. Um, it's a fantastic resource. It actually has a list of all the, I say children, but it includes adolescents as well, um, child and adolescent treatment centers that are available in Ontario, and it also has parent resources. So that's another great uh, website. Well, I want to thank all of you panelists for sharing your expertise and the experiences uh, that will help with our uh, youth and parents. Um, I also want to uh, uh, just remind everybody the rooms that um, they're going to be in. Um, Rosalinda Chichi is in uh, 108, uh, titled The Teenage Brain. Dr. Sula Humatitis is in 111. The ABC is recognizing and responding to mental health concerns in schools. Uh, Ms. Lynn McLernan is in 109, Mental Health First Aid. Aisha Santish is in 110, Mental Health Matters, New York Region Perspective. And uh, Lisa Wood in 107, Tackling Stress and Anxiety, Health and Wellness Strategies for Young People. And uh, I'd like to ask now Mauricio to give us our closing remarks. So um, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to come up with some, a few closing remarks um, to thank uh, everybody uh, for coming today. Um, once I'm done that, uh, we will uh, proceed to the workshops, and from that point on, uh, the only one thing, once we're all done and you go through and see the workshops and get the information you, you, you want to get, the only last thing I ask is before you leave, there's still tons of food back there. <laughs> so please do me a favor so I don't go crazy. Help yourself before you take off uh, for lunch. So, uh, a couple of those remarks. I would thank the panelists as well uh, for sharing all their insight uh, with us this morning. Um, you made uh, this learning experience uh, very knowledgeable and uh, a lot of information that has come out so far. And I know it's going to be a lot more um, as we go through uh, to the workshops. I'd also like to thank the, the um, planning committee uh, that we worked together uh, in collaborating and making uh, this uh, workshop uh, a really memorable one uh, and a successful one today. Um, a lot of hard work, a lot of dedication, a lot of time. Uh, some of the things I'd like to also ask as well, um, and I'd like to thank sincerely uh, to start uh, the principal here at St. Max, Peter Parente. Sir, where are you? There you are, in the back. Thank you very much for walking to school. Uh, Vice Principal Jim Marin. Is he around somewhere? Okay, no problem. I'd like to thank him as well. Um, all the staff and students here at St. Max, all the administrative uh, administrators for the schools, teachers, that have all shown up and their continuing support in mental health and the subject matter that is here today. Um, special thanks to uh, Dominique, uh, Dominique Vernon. She, there she is. Uh, she's our, our um, a spokesperson for York, uh, York Regional Police uh, in terms of the mental health unit as well for them that she's come in and provided information to all of us. So I thank you uh, for showing. Um, a special thanks to Natalie Romier and Lisa Cavero, who are from uh, their teachers from St. Cardinal, Car from Cardinal Carter High School uh, in Aurora uh, for helping facilitate this morning.
amazing speakers and all the additional work. I have to give one little thanks to this because um, volunteer a bunch of their time uh, as administrators for a parental group on the matter and they dedicate a lot of hours and stuff. So a special thanks to both of you for, for helping out and continuing this, this positive momentum. Um, and finally, a very special thanks to Savannah Greco. Where are you? She, there she is. Okay, Savannah Greco's over there. Um, for being a liaison for us at the board and uh, helping to manage and do all the logistics for this conference. Without her, this would not piece together. So, Savannah, thank you very much. Um, finally, uh, like I said, before I let everybody go, I would thank all of you for participating in today, today's uh, topic. Oh, okay. we'll get there. Uh, for everybody participating in the topic, um, and again, all the presentations have been posted out there. The last little bit that I just want to make sure that I thank is for all the trustees and the uh, senior members of the board that have also been here today and have participated and shown their continued support to us as parents. Uh, to us as, as, as just every people and to our students to make sure that the mental health initiative is continuing strong in our schools and continuing forward. So I hope that everybody is going to enjoy the rest of their day, enjoy going to the panelists, getting information that you need, and if you have any questions and or concerns, feel free to contact either us at the YCPIC or your local administrative school to get more information uh, with the mental health initiative. Thank you again today.